Good morning, Catherine. Hey, Sarah. I'm Sarah Posner, and this is The Posner Show, and my guest today is Catherine Joyce. Uh, Catherine is an investigative journalist who's been on the show before to discuss her book, The Child Catchers, uh, and she's also the author of the book Quiverful, both of which I highly recommend. And uh, we're going to talk today about the new cover piece she has in the American Prospect magazine. Uh, the title is by Grace Alone, and it is about uh, sexual harassment and abuse at um, evangelical institutions like universities and within missionary organizations and about a rather heroic organization that's trying to do something about it. Um, in any case, it's a really great piece. Congratulations. Uh, it's the most, to me, the most thorough examination of this uh, topic that uh, anyone has done and a really important uh, contribution to our understanding of what is going on at these institutions and also why um, sexual uh, abuse and assault has been so intractable there at these at these sorts of institutions. Right. So, um a great deal um, of the piece is about what has gone on at Bob Jones University, um, the fundamentalist Baptist college in Greenville, South Carolina, which I think is best known to people for its uh, one-time policy of um, preventing, uh, prohibiting interracial dating on right. campus. Until uh, recently, and its- until like 2000. Right. And it lost its tax exempt status over that. And uh, it's something that was very motivating to the religious right. Um, In the early days, uh, they felt that it was very unfair of the government to um, revoke a religious institution's tax exempt status over a disagreement like that over policy. But in any case, um, uh, Bob Jones uh, is thinks of itself as the fortress of faith. Um, Yet it seems to have had uh, an ongoing problem with uh, sexual assault on campus that it hasn't dealt with. Uh, So why don't you talk a little bit about what the cases that um, you uh, reported on there, and then we can talk about the response by um, when uh, Bob Jones hired Grace, which is an organization Godly Response to Abuse in the Christian Environment, which is run by um, Billy Graham's grandson. Um, and Billy Graham, of course, went to Bob Jones. Right. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about what's been what's been going on at, at Bob Jones University. Sure. Um, well, just to start out, Grace's report uh, on Bob Jones is not yet out. So I, I can't really offer any insight into what's in there except what we were able to find by by doing a number of interviews with people who also interviewed with Grace. Right. So I, I spoke to to eight former students and staff uh, from from Bob Jones University and heard a range of different stories. Um, kind of to back up a little bit, Grace was uh, hired by Bob Jones in 2012, and, and this was a pretty shocking development uh, because Bob Jones is this incredibly insular institution. In a lot of ways, it's like a total institution. Uh, people are, you know, people used to be born on campus uh, at the Bob Jones Hospital. They would go to Bob Jones Academy there on school. Uh, many families lived on Bob Jones campus, many faculty families, that is, uh, who didn't even need to have cars because so many of their needs were taken care of right there within the walls of Bob Jones University. They had you know, their own post office like many schools do, but also their own dining commons and their own dry cleaners. There was almost no reason to leave. Um, a lot of people who did leave would end up being kind of graduated out to the larger Bob Jones network across the country. So uh, that would mean, you know, when you graduate, you you go to the registrar's office and you look at a book and you see, okay, here are the four approved churches for Columbus, Ohio. These mm-hmm. are the, the four schools that are affiliated with the school in that they send back students or send money or other forms of support to, to Bob Jones University. And so this is where we're going to go when we move to this new city. So not so, only is the, the, the university itself the campus itself very insular, but the entire network that fans out from it is very insular. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's it's kind of a network uh, 
that that you could live in your your entire life uh, going to these churches um, when you have your own children raising them according to Bob Jones curriculum from uh, their curriculum publisher you know listening to Bob Jones uh, radio stations that are broadcast uh, across the country so it's really in a way you have to understand that Bob Jones is not just any school uh, but it is this kind of bedrock institution of fundamentalist uh, Christianity in the United States. Now, let's be clear about what 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 some of the ramifications are of how insular the campus is. Things like going off campus to get pizza can get you in trouble. Yes. Uh, I, I spoke to all these students, and everybody had a story to tell about receiving demerits. So there's this kind of in, interesting demerit system at Bob Jones, or at least there was during the time that, that these students were there where uh, you're allowed to get up to 150 demerits per semester before you end up getting uh, suspended or expelled. But the things that you get demerits for are are not the things you would get in trouble for at other college campuses. There are room checks uh, for kind of clean rooms uh, six days a week. So if you hadn't vacuumed your room uh, that morning, you can get 10 demerits. Uh, and, and these start to build up. And from what I understand, you know, if you if you keep doing it, then the number of demerits you get uh, becomes more with each violation. So people got in serious trouble for going off campus to get pizza. Um, one student I spoke to kind of ended up being expelled for a trifecta of violations, uh, one of which included being caught watching an episode of Glee in a Starbucks off campus. Another one was sending a tweet, and another one was posting lyrics to uh, Christian contemporary music, which is banned on campus. So, I mean, you have a sense that this is not just any old conservative Christian school standards there are, are really strict in a way that they are not at a lot of other, a lot of, of even evangelical schools. Um, right. So with all of this in mind, let's talk about what happens if a student has been sexually assaulted on campus by another student or even by, um, has, has it happened that a faculty has, has assaulted anyone? Sure. Um, well, so I, I spoke to uh, a few different uh, young women who had dealt with sexual assault uh, either just before they, they came to Bob Jones or while they were students there. Um, I mean, so everybody's individual story uh, plays out a little bit differently, of course, but there mm -hmm. are a lot of notable similarities. Um, to start with the, the case of a woman who was violently raped, uh, not at Bob Jones, but in her hometown in a, another state, but just weeks before she ended up uh, matriculating at Bob Jones, she she came to school. Um, she was having you know a hard time dealing with adjusting as any uh, freshman would, uh, but especially in the wake of being violently attacked. And she's the one actually who got in trouble for for ending up going off campus to get pizza with some friends. So this, this landed her on intensive disciplinary counseling. Uh, and when she finally kind of broke down and told the counselor, listen, I've got bigger problems to deal with than having gone off campus for pizza, uh, she disclosed her rape. The, the dorm counselor, who is just a grad student, um, but they're the kind of first line of defense for any counseling or disciplinary needs at Bob Jones University, uh, that dorm counselor brought her to sort of uh, the main counselor. At the time, it was the dean of students, uh, Jim Berg, who ended up being a key figure in, in a lot of the stories, and, and I imagine is probably going to be a key figure in the Grace Report when it finally comes out. Mm -hmm. um, but she was, when she came there, uh, you know, the first questions that she was asked um, were some of the questions that you might imagine any person who is particularly insensitive uh, to rape asking, because um, we see this at secular colleges too. But uh, she says that the dean asked her, had you been drinking? Uh, what were you wearing? Uh, were you smoking pot? Right. The um, sort of, you know, sort of run of the mill victim, victim blaming blaming. sort of yeah. questions. Right. 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 So uh, after that, after she uh, said no, n none of those things were, were at issue in her rape, he then said that there there is a sin that caused your rape. Below every sin, there is another sin. Um, and there is a sin uh, below the sin that was this man raping you. Um, she ran out of the office, uh, and, you know, she was horrified, but she was also afraid that if, if she responded, uh, like she wanted to, she would end up getting expelled. Uh, 
kind of, I think, one striking thing about that story is she says that neither the dean nor the counselor she initially went to ever checked back up on her to see if she was okay. So that's one story, but there was uh, an aspect of that that seemed to be uh, a commonality to a lot of stories about how Bob Jones dealt with sexual assault. Um, This idea that uh, not just victim blaming in the sense that we normally understand it, but victim blaming in the sense that there, there is a sin in your life that actually led you to experience this sin against you. Um, right. So it's it's not just what were you wearing, were you drinking sort of right. questions, but that there's something deeper, some right. deeper sin in your life that you've got to, what, repent from, uh, exactly. repent for. Uh, so it's it's like a, a spiritual victim blaming almost, as opposed to sort of what it happens frequently in a secular setting where it's more mm-hmm. like, you know, you were wearing something provocative, you led the guy on, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, it's like normal victim blaming uh, kind of on steroids. It's, it's taking it to this whole kind of spiritual level that mm-hmm. before you confront somebody uh, for the sin that they've done against you, you're going to need to reckon with and repent from your own sin. Um, so that was. And is, it as, and is this suggestion almost that this wouldn't have happened to you? That this is God's way of punishing you for your sinfulness? Well, I mean, I, I think that that suggestion That's is there. That's the undercurrent, but, kind of. But but almost more that uh, you know the the bigger issue that we have to grapple with is is the sin that led to this issue in the first place. Uh, we don't need to deal with your trauma from the rape. Um, and that kind of seems to go in line uh, with some other things I found that that didn't end up making it into the the completed story. But mm-hmm. you know, Bob Jones, uh, other Bob Jones faculty have said things like, you know, women who are assaulted uh, need not worry because it's it's only the throwaway part of their bodies that's been violated. Um, I suppose, what does that mean? I suppose that means uh, your vagina is a throwaway part. Um, I see. Yes. And your soul has not been violated, I guess. Yeah, that what? too. That too. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there were a number of stories that, that seemed to fit into this category and seemed to go back uh, some decades. I spoke to uh, a former faculty member who had herself been a Bob Jones student, uh, I believe, back in the late 80s or early 90s. And back then, um, with the same faculty member the who became the dean, uh, you know, she also had friends who, who went to him because they were sexually assaulted, they were raped, they had been molested by family members, um, and overall tended to be given the same sort of what we recognize as, as bad advice, as bad counseling, uh, you know, either blaming them in some form or e- in a couple of cases where they weren't blamed, still counseling them not to go to uh, law enforcement, not to report this to the police because they would be shaming their families, because they would ruin their families, and no one would ever forgive them. So, you know, not not the sort of advice we expect from, you know, from counseling professionals who are used to working their entire careers with young adults who are vulnerable. So, I mean, I imagine that for uh, an 18-year-old woman who's been raised in this extremely devout fundamentalist environment, being told that the reason for her rape had to do with some sin within herself was incredibly frightening and, uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I, she told me she, she did not, uh, tell anybody else about, about her rape for years. Uh, she only ended up disclosing it to her parents, I think about five years later. Um, you know, and so she went all this time not being able to talk to anyone about it, not being able to get any sort of good counseling, uh, going around feeling that, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps this guy had been right in telling her that there was something she had done to deserve this. Right. And and that's just really compounds the trauma and, and drags it on for years. And that's, that's not what, that's not what school should be doing. That's not what religious authorities should be doing, obviously. Well, and, and your story opens with this, uh, detail about a young woman who, well, a girl, really, she was 15 years old um, and she was raped by one of her church's deacons. And the pastor of the church was what's called a, um, uh, you know, he was a Bob Jones graduate and he was part of the network of, of people who fanned out to these. Yeah. uh, He was actually a board member uh, and a board member, a member of the board of trustees, as well as a member of the the mission board. And also uh, I think a board for youth camps. 
So, so a he, prominent person within yes, the Bob Jones absolutely. University and the network. And he made her stand up. In, and so she had been raped and got pregnant, 15 years right. old, by a deacon in the congregation. And the pastor, Chuck Phelps, made her stand up in front of the congregation and confess. Yeah, he, he had had her write a letter uh, confessing, you know, what had happened. And he got up and said, you know, we have a matter of church discipline um, and said, you know, that she was pregnant, read this letter. Well, she had to stand there. Um, and from what I understand in uh, media coverage, because 2020 broke that story a few years ago, uh, you know, she was just standing there sobbing while hundreds of people in the church are just staring at her and... And judging her, um, and the not, deacon was not understanding punished. this was raped, <laughs> right? And the deacon and the deacon didn't deny that this had happened, and and he was never punished. Uh, to my understanding, he was not at the time. Though I believe uh, that after 2020 broke this story in 2011 about Tina mm -hmm. Anderson, I, I believe that he was then charged. Okay, um, but it took. National. I mean, that was TV it, it was more than a decade happen. later. It was more than right. a decade later, and this young woman, at fifteen, had been sent away from from her home and her family in New Hampshire, to uh, a family in Colorado, basically for her confinement. Um, she was sent away uh, for the entire time she was pregnant to to have this child, relinquish the child for adoption, um, and I understand uh, did did not really return from there for quite a while. So, um, okay, so I think we've gotten a, a feel for the some of the incidents that happened. And so at what point, it seems sort of surprising that such an insular institution like Bob Jones would even bring on an outside group like Grace to right. address this issue. So how did how did that happen? Well, yeah, that, that was, uh, I think, quite a shock to a lot of people, uh, a lot of observers, when it happened in late 2012. Um, when the Tina Anderson story came out, uh, and it came out very prominently on 2020, uh, there was already a network of uh, critics of Bob Jones. A lot of times they were alumni of the school themselves, or else they had come from other communities in fundamentalism and had started to speak out online, had started to be... Uh, an organized group of, of critics who were discussing fundamentalism um, and how it had hurt them as children or as young adults um, or, you know, as adults. They were kind of organizing in a number of Facebook groups and uh, some websites and blogs that were set up. When the Tina Anderson story came out, I think a lot of these critics saw this as uh, a bit of a moment um, that really crystallized a lot of their concerns and their critiques. And on campus at Bob Jones, uh, you know, some students started to organize in support of rape victims. Um, they, a lot of people started to call for the resignation of Chuck Phelps, the, the man who had been Tina Anderson's pastor and who had compelled her to, to stand and, and undergo that confession. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways, this just became a galvanizing moment uh, for a lot of uh, dissatisfaction with where where Bob Jones had gone, um, with what a lot of people were seeing as uh, a model of Christianity uh, or fundamentalism that was no longer relevant um, and and badly needed to be updated and modernized. So a lot of those people were starting to to push the school, you know, to get rid of Chuck Phelps, but also to make other sort of modernizing reforms in terms of protecting the academic freedom of students as well as teachers, in in loosening some of their kind of famously and and longstanding uh, strict regulations, and. All of this sort of culminated in, in a push for Bob Jones to hire Grace. Um, and so when Bob Jones actually did, uh, this, was, this was a huge moment, not just because they were calling in any old outsider to come in. I mean, that, that alone, to have uh, an independent group come in and conduct independent scrutiny of your school, that, that alone is a big step. But there was also this historical baggage um, in terms of who Bob Jones is and who Grace is uh, that made this particularly interesting um, because... Right, because Grace is yep. run by Billy Graham's grandson, Boz Chivigian, is that how Chivigian, it's yep. Chivigian, yep. <laughs> Chivigian. Rhymes with religion, they say. Okay. And uh, 
Bob Jones sort of notoriously had some disputes with with Billy, uh, Graham. Billy Graham, yeah, because he thought that Billy Graham's crusades were too, um, you know, too much too modernizing, at, too, too modern, too <laughs> ecumenical, uh, seems, too accommodating, yeah. right? Yeah. And also to um, also, you know, Billy Graham um, integrated many of his crusades, which I'm sure at the time was not something that Bob Jones yes. approved of. Uh, Absolutely. So. Um, but let's let's back up a little bit about grace because I think um, Boz has has talked about the problem of sexual abuse and assault within Christian and uh, institutions. I mean, he's somebody who has drawn attention to this being a problem not just at Bob Jones but at other institutions and has really tried to address it from a Christian perspective that that I think brings brings in this scrutiny in a way that perhaps wouldn't um, antagonize some of these institutions in a way that an outsider would. Does that make uh, sense? Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that that is, that is one of the most important things about grace is that they are able uh, to make a very impassioned, uh, I think, and a, a very uncompromising case uh, for the need to deal uh, with these issues, uh, with sexual assault, uh, with rape, with molestation, in a very serious and rigorous way. Um, but it's coming from almost the, the consummate insider, uh, from Billy Graham's grandson, um, from, from Franklin Graham's uh, nephew. You know, mm-hmm. this is kind of, Billy Graham was America's pastor, as they said. This, right. this was the family of, of evangelical Christianity in America. And he was a figure that was, I think, very well beloved um, outside of evangelical culture as well. Uh, this, this is a man kind of with national standing. Um, and, and so it's, but I also think... But someone who, who has, you know, from reading your article, it seems that he has refused to, um, he has refused to accept any foot dragging or excuse making or victim blaming yep. um, within his own culture. Like he really sees this as, I hesitate to use this word, as, as, a, as a mission for himself yep. to really eradicate something that he sees as, he justifiably sees as um, terrible to the, for the victims, obviously, but also for the integrity of these institutions. Absolutely. I mean, I think kind of the larger context to this is, uh, and I talk about this a fair amount in the piece, um, uh, but the sense that the the Protestant church uh, as a whole, um, you know, with all of its tens of thousands of denominations, but it might be standing on the brink of having uh, a sex abuse crisis as as serious um, and as devastating as the one which hit the Catholic church. Uh, Mm -hmm. But there is no Vatican. There is no, nope. you know, you know, because there's all these different denominations and non-denominational yep. organizations and institutions. And parachurch ministries and schools right. and all these other institutions. Yeah, there's there's no there's no single higher authority. There's no kind of structural hierarchy uh, through which this stuff could be addressed. Not that the Catholic Church did a good right. job at addressing it, of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but grace there isn't is even kind of the only model there. that's out there right now to that's actually saying this, this is not, this is not a problem of a few bad apples. Uh, this is a systemic issue and we need to start addressing it in a systemic way. And we need to understand, uh, the patterns of this. Um, and you know, part of that, uh, I was very interested to learn is, is that, you know, churches end up uh, becoming kind of havens for abusers, and it's not because uh, it's it, that's not because Christians are inherently more abusive, uh, but rather because they're they're kind of our structural things about churches and religious institutions that make them a lot more vulnerable uh, to people who are kind of consciously out there being predators. Um, uh, they, well, they, also, also, mm-hmm. Boz said something in the piece about people being. Um, forgiving in the sense that they, you know, they think that, well, you know, someone can be redeemed from sin, meaning abusers can be redeemed from sin. So very often they're sort of naively looking past some, some 
red right. flags. Exactly. I mean, they're they're so much more willing uh, in the first place to open their doors to everyone. I mean, that's that's a church. They want converts. They want to bring new people into the fold. Uh, and you know, on a very practical level, they're always looking for volunteers. So that's kind of one step. And then the the second step is, uh, you know, what Boz I think would say is this uh, kind of very mis mistaken application of the doctrine of Christian forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Um, That is kind of something that's foisted on victims all the time. So victims come forward and and they've been badly hurt uh, and they are told uh, by pastors or by leaders of a mission group or a school, you know, all right, this may have happened, but, but you need to forgive. And if you don't forgive now, you're the one who's sinning. Um, So this in a way kind of, compounds the abuse from being just sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse, but also adds this element of what Grace calls spiritual abuse, right. which is kind of misusing spirituality and faith to compel someone to do something that's that's not good for them, uh, like forgive the person who has molested them and who has still not been held accountable to the law or to any other authority. Well, what's something, something that struck me reading the piece was that you know, first you have the comparison to the Catholic Church. And I think the Catholic Church's instinct, obviously, is to protect itself and close ranks um, around the abusive priests or the bishops who protected them and so on and so forth. I mean, that's the instinct of an institution um, when facing these sorts of terrible accusations. Um, Even in the face, uh, in, in the Catholic Church's case, even in the face of overwhelming evidence of the truth of these accusations, um, and what really struck me as um, heroic for for Grace and for Boz as a person was that even though this is his world, very much his world, um, and the world of his family, his instinct is not to close ranks around yeah. the people in authority. And yeah. that, I think, in the evangelical and the fundamentalist world is a very difficult thing to do because the idea of spiritual authority is very intense um that you know the 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 pastor or the leader or the president or whomever of an institution is someone who's in a position of authority and and thus given a lot of deference and um something that struck me not about Boz and Grace was not just that they're addressing this widespread problem but they're doing it in a way that presents broader challenges to the way this world operates. Right. Yeah, I I think that that is absolutely accurate. And I mean, I think, um, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but I think a lot of kind of that that drive um, and that willingness uh, or ability, kind of that that clear-sightedness to kind of see that that there is an issue kind of with the structure of hierarchy uh, probably comes in part from Boss's background as uh, a prosecutor. Um, so uh-huh. I, right. maybe you as a, as a former lawyer uh, <laughs> have some insights into that as well. But um, for for many years, he he worked in a DA's office uh, leading, uh, leading a unit that uh, solely prosecuted uh, child sex abuse cases. Right. And he worked on hundreds of these cases. Um, learned a lot about uh, about the offenders or the alleged offenders. Um, so we started to notice patterns there, uh, you know, started to to do a lot of studying and, and heard uh, some of these offenders tell uh, clinicians who are studying this issue that, you know, Christians, church people are easy to fool, um, basically that they're easy marks for people who are coming, coming in uh, intending to do harm. Um, but but also he he saw the culpability of uh, the religious institutions in in not responding correctly. Uh, that if pastors showed up to court, you know, nine times out of ten, it would be to sit behind the the defendant, the accused, rather than to be there in a supportive role for the victim. Um, and that you know he started hearing these stories about uh, pastors encouraging uh, victims and their families not to go forward to law enforcement. So. I think right. it so was it's, kind it's of immersion really stepping in this. outside that world enabled him to like see it from the outside in, as opposed to looking at it from the inside in his work as a prosecutor. It enabled him to look for, as an outsider at the, at the religious world. Uh, for, for him personally, that seems to be his story. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, but I think, you know, I, I, I do think that there are a lot of Christians um, 
from from all perspectives and denominations who are starting to get very concerned about this. Right, right. Um, so at one point, Bob Jones fired Grace, which caused yes. a great deal of controversy, but they hired them back. And so now they are, they being Grace, they're continuing to work on their report um, about Bob Jones. And when is that? Is there a time frame for that to become public? We, we don't know exactly. Um, uh, Grace has been, uh, you know, very, very reluctant to, to speak publicly about what's what's been going on with the, the Bob Jones report. Um, mm-hmm. So the most we know is from an update that they published publicly to their website uh, about a month ago, saying that they anticipated finishing up uh, the last of their interviews in April because they, as you said, they, they did get fired after uh, about a year's worth of interviews, uh, more than 100 interviews with former uh, students, staff, current faculty. Um, Bob Jones pulled back, fired them out of the blue. Uh, there was an avalanche of public criticism all across the board, um, and I think most notably coming from within their own community. Uh, this time it wasn't just outsiders criticizing them. Right. It, was, it was people within the Bob Jones fold saying, this is appalling, how could you do this? Um, so they hired them back, uh, and when they hired them back, uh, Grace uh, Grace noted in its update that uh, Grace was contacted by uh, a number of additional people who now wanted to testify and share their experiences. So it's that, that firing almost had the reverse effect of bringing more people out of the, wood, the right. woodwork, um, you know, wanting to, to share stories and, and say say what they had gone through. So I believe that that Grace uh, is, according to their update, starting to uh, starting to draft their report um, now in May and early May. And there are some additional steps that will have to happen after that. And then uh, it might be next month, it might be July, but I think I think pretty soon we're going to see that report. So aside from Bob Jones, Grace has has done this sort of work for other institutions or organizations? This is its third report. Uh, It did two previous reports, both for international missionary organizations that had issues uh, with missionary kids or MKs. Uh, Mm -hmm. In Christian culture, MKs are are the children of missionaries who are serving out in the field in other countries. Um, So these MKs in in both mission groups had been abused uh, by, by staff of the mission organization themselves. And this had happened on a fairly widespread level, and the abuse had been uh, pretty systematic and and very severe. So that's right. I mean, your your story, your piece um, lays that out in yeah. some detail, and it's just very disturbing. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, so what's next? Do you think? I mean, do you think that there are going to be more institutions who are going to hire Grace? I mean, do you think that this will lead to? Is this basically opening up um, a greater examination of sex abuse in, uh, he, he calls it very broadly the Protestant church, but, you know, uh, you know, evangelical missionary right. fundamentalist, et cetera, organizations. Right. I think, I think that's kind of the question um, that, that we're looking at now. Uh, these investigations are, are not easy um, on anyone. I, I don't mm-hmm. think um, if there if there are institutions that are coming forward uh, with issues of of sex abuse or harassment or rape or molestation in their pasts, and and we're seeing that just at a shocking rate. I mean, just look at the past year alone. Look look in the past three months alone, and kind of you can count. <laughs> it would take more than two hands to count all of the different prominent evangelical or fundamentalist ministries and leaders that have fallen uh, because of allegations of basically sexual wrongdoing of, Mm -hmm. you know, abuse of authority or harassment or rape or molestation. Um, It's, it's almost as though kind of dominoes are starting to fall. And I think we can expect to see a lot more because every time, uh, you know, any time that there is a, a scandal like sovereign grace ministries, people People outside that community are reading it too. People from mm-hmm. other churches, people who grew up in Bill Gothard's ATI are reading that and they're thinking, you know right. what, we have some stories too and let's get organized and start our own blog. And now people are right. reading that blog. It's, I mean, just this sort of thing, 
I think it inspires more people to start talking out. So I think these stories are going to continue. Um, mm -hmm. That's for sure. But I think kind of what the response is going to be at an institutional level, uh, we, we have yet to see. I think there are a couple of options. You could see all of these institutions kind of following the Catholic model and lawyering up, uh, you know, really strenuously and fighting back, um, you know, with venom against the people who are coming forward with these allegations. And interestingly, uh, this is something that, that didn't make it into the story, but there was, uh, there was actually um, an interesting kind of memo written by two, two attorneys in Colorado who have represented the Catholic Church, and they were writing this this paper uh, arguing that um, basically that there is kind of this ambulance chasing uh, reparations industry that is now uh, setting its sights on Protestant churches and ministries. And these are becoming a new market. And, you know, these, these churches and ministries have to get wise to the lessons that the Catholic Church learned and, you know, start to defend themselves as well as the Catholic Church had done. And so bear in mind, again, these were the defense attorneys for the Catholic Church right. that was accused of pedophilia. Right. Um, so they were saying, you know, follow our example. And what the Catholic Church did, you know, it's... It's pretty roundly recognized to have been uh, atrocious. They attacked victims in court. Um, they they tried to paint, uh, you know, children who had been molested. They tried to paint them as promiscuous. I mean, so this is one way that you know th that response could go. People in these kind of newly under critique uh, Protestant churches and ministries could follow the example of the Catholic Church, I guess. Or the other option is uh, they could consider this. Uh, radical uh, alternative that's being proposed by grace. And that is open yourselves up, um, you know, let an investigation be done, let people come forward and give testimony and tell their stories. And, you know, let us conduct this according to the rules of an independent investigation. And then a report will come out that both the victims can see and the institution can see. And if it becomes public, then it probably will be public for the public to see as well. But, you know, grace at kind of at their core, um, this, this can sound, uh, you know, like it's just a little bit of churchy rhetoric, but actually, if you think about, uh, what they're proposing, it's really a, quite a radical idea that churches need to set aside their concern for their own reputation. If they really want to rise above just kind of, uh, the normal standard of institutional survival, uh, and they want to kind of put their money where their mouth is in, in terms of believing in what they say they believe in, uh, then they should open themselves up for kind of a radical transparency and allow these things to be known, uh, allow it to be clear that they made mistakes, not only in the abuse that happened, but usually in terms of the institution's response in, in covering that up or in shaming the victim or in discouraging them from going forward to law enforcement. Um, right. and, and that if they can do this, this actually has an incredibly powerful effect uh, on, on the whole dynamic of that conversation. Uh, when the first investigation that Grace did for a mission group called New Tribes Missions, when they had their report come out, and it was damning, it was, you know, it was just written in scathing language, um, and the recommendations it made uh, were you know, incredibly, you know, uh, burdensome to the institution. At first, New Tribe's mission accepted that report. I mean, their long-term response was more disappointing, but at first they accepted that, and they said, you know, we're ashamed, uh, we are, you know, digesting this report, and we are going to implement these recommendations. And the, re the response of a lot of the, the victims of New Tribe's mission, the children who had been abused in their boarding schools uh, abroad, was just, it was really kind of a, a feeling of catharsis. Um, this right. was something that they had really never expected to happen, um, and it was really kind of what they wanted, was a full accounting and uh, a full kind of acknowledging of of the institutional responsibility. And, so and what their, happened their failure. after this initial response? After the initial response, it seemed that uh, things kind of went back to the status quo of 
you know, CYA and then mm. New Tribe's mission and its subsequent investigations of other schools has not used grace. But that first kind of, uh, I think that there is a lot of promise there from mm. that very first investigation and the response and the effects that that had in, in the victims' lives. And that's kind of what Grace keeps getting back to is when you do this, when you can do this, uh, it's, it's not just that it's the best possible result for, for victims in terms of having someone come forward and fully take accountability for what happened, but it has this secondary benefit also of uh, being an alternative to the court system and to, to civil litigation. Because as, as Boz said, uh, you know, for a lot of victims, what they want more than anything is an apology, uh, a sincere apology and sincere taking of responsibility. They don't that necessarily want to press criminal charges. They're not charges. necessarily looking for a settlement. Mm -hmm. I mean, criminal charges are one thing. Uh, and, and if a crime has been done, those should be committed. But in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, the sort of lawsuits that we've seen bankrupt uh, multiple Catholic dioceses, then, you know, that's that's kind of the more the, the question of institutional survival. That so we're he's talking basically about. saying, you know, look, you can avoid that by being you, you might avoid that. And, yeah, you, know, you might avoid that. Right. Like the bad news is going to come out, uh, but right. you have you have a chance about how you're going to face this? Are you going right. to face this like the Catholic Church did? Or are you going to, to face this by taking responsibility? Right. And, right. you know, seeing if you can own up to some of this. And right. I think that's the choice that we're left with. And I mean, we've got to watch and see. Right. Well, thank you so much for talking thank about you. the story today. Again, it's by Grace Alone. Um, it's up um, at the American Prospects website, but also um, in the magazine and on newsstands. Uh, and I highly recommend reading it. And if you also, I think if you read it online, there are some additional features um, that you can uh, click on throughout the course of the story where you can read additional testimonies by um, uh, victims and um, I think some other things too, right? Yes, yes, there's some uh, additional web, web build out. Okay. Well, great. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.